Good evening. Um, I'm going to try this. I just thought about it literally seconds ago and I thought, well, let me see if it works. Um, no, not this. Uh, the, the idea that I should... Um, I've got nobody here and I'm going to pretend that you're here. So I'm going to talk to you and I'm going to pretend that you're asking me questions. For example, why on earth are you using your sunglasses to open a beer? I'm Andrew Cynthia White. Join me as I share my passion for building four-wheel drive trucks and then traveling to the remotest parts of the world. Because these sunglasses are made of titanium. I think these would be very popular in Australia. I wonder why I think that. William Painter. Now, I saw an advert for sunglasses on my channel and um, it was so funny I watched it all the way through and clicked on it. It was absolutely brilliant little piece of advertising and it was for William Painter sunglasses and I'm smiling now I'm just remembering how funny it it was and I immediately said, I, I just sent them a message on their website saying, I think your ad is fantastic. He watches the channel. He watches the channel and sent me two pairs. Alrighty, so there you go. I just thought I would share that with you. So, I'm, I'm, uh, I use, I've been using pre-cooked meals that I get from Aldi. And, um, have you ever been to Aldi? Those of you who haven't been to Aldi, it's, a, it's like a supermarket for, for, for food that blokes enjoy. I hate shopping. I hate malls. I hate shopping for clothes, as you can tell. I like shopping for cameras. I like shopping for cameras. Okay? The worst thing in the world is going in and doing food shopping. Now, luckily, Gwyn doesn't ask me to do it very often with her, but when she does, it's uh, a quick affair because she knows, but also she's very efficient. I don't think she likes food shopping much either, which is a great relief to me. So, um, and I've been, I mean, uh, and the reason why I mentioned Aldi is they've got a line down the middle with, with, with nice little things. I got, I wish I had them here to show you. I got two packs of um, cable ties that you would pay, oh, at least $15 Bunnings for that, about five to six different sizes in a five dollars. I bought two of them, um, and I've got a, um, a vernier, a, a digital vernier in my workshop that I. It's lovely, twenty dollars. I had never bought a digital vernier before because they were, you know, they were really expensive, and I didn't really need it. And then twenty dollars. I thought, hang on a minute, twenty dollars. That's what I did. Righty. So, um, cheers. Your very good health. What I like to do. I'm not a big drinker. In fact, I, I drink socially only, and and since I don't have any friends, that's very rare. So, um, I, but I like on a camp. It's just kind of a reward for the day is a beer. And I put in various beers, not all the same, and I have a habit where I, I never look. I just, one at the top. The one at the top is the one I will drink. Unless I decide otherwise, but generally speaking, that's what happens. I have uh, my, cooking, my cooking stuff. The partner steel stove that comes that's made in Idaho. That's just such a, it's a nice. It's very crude. I like it because the burner is uh, subtle. You you can get a nice little, um, a, a nice. You can control the flame, and I always say around the camp, best thing to do around the camp is get the cutlery out of the way. Just get it out of the way, because then. Um, yeah, well, it speaks for itself, doesn't it? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I feel like um, I was talking about uh, pre-cooked meals 
that I get from Aldi and um, I just feel like some home some home cooking which means that I'm going to make some toasties ham and cheese toasties unfortunately I forgot to buy uh, I'd say didn't forget to buy tomatoes but the tomatoes didn't make it into the car together with the what I like to call nachis which I believe in Australia you call you call uh, never mind <coughs> I can't remember what you call them now in Australia uh, small orange fruit segmented citrus fruit uh, very very sweet easy to peel anyway so so I'm going to um, just warm up the pan You see, that's what you can do with this. Nice, slow heat. Um, I'm not a cook. I don't, I don't particularly enjoy cooking. I enjoy and I can appreciate very good food. I can definitely do that. So around the camp, um, I don't like it to be a, a, a fuss. Unless I've got time. If I've got time, then I don't, then I don't mind. You know, I've got time now. Then it's just kind of... You know kind of pleasant um, but I'm no chef and uh, I will cook a knockout breakfast a breakfast I'll really do a good breakfast right how do I open this I know I'll write to them and ask them oh good WA Western Australia it means it'll answer will get to me in six weeks Something about Australia, it's, it is such a big country that even if you send an ordinary mail via the, post, the Australian Post Service, which is, which is pretty efficient, I mean, I, I can't complain about it. Things take a long time. Okay, there's no way to open this properly. When I'm driving, I like to listen to audiobooks. So, um, for those of you who are new, for those of you who like to read, I find the Audible books absolutely wonderful. I have managed to get through more books in the last couple of years than I would have ever done by simply reading. Because I find that reading, when I'm reading, I fall asleep. I don't mean to, I just, I just do. It just lulls me to sleep. So, um, so the answer is audible reading books absolutely love them absolutely love them i'm reading now so when i say reading i mean listening to a book on the falklands war um, max hastings is a well-known um, english historian he has written many books that i've enjoyed about um, english mostly english military history that i like I recently finished a book and I, 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 re I read it, listen to it, um, and then stopped and immediately read it again. Three books, same thing. Uh, John Cleese, um, I'm just trying to think, um, oh, oh, oh well, oh well, or something like that. Yeah, John Cleese, oh well, I think it's called. Um, Eddie Izzard. Because I collect comedy as a hobby. I've collected comedy since I was very young. Since, since, I got a, since I got a cassette tape recorder, which would have been probably when I was seven. I got a little cassette tape recorder. Isn't it funny? I even remember the model name. It was called a Sanyo M48M. Why is that piece of information stuck in my head? Isn't that weird how the brain works? Anyway, um, so... And I've got, at the moment in my collection, Tony Hancock's probably about 40. These are radio shows. Goons, there were a total of 161, as far as I know, recorded. And I probably have about 140 of them. There are a very small number that I haven't got in my collection. So, of course, I've read almost all of Spike Milligan's books. 
Um, so Eddie Izzard, his book was called Something Something and Jazz Chickens. And again, I just I listened to it and I just started again. Sensationally good. And he was very funny because he's a natural ad libber. He would ad lib the book, so he would read the book and then suddenly go on a tangent. And he would go on tangents on the tangents of the tangents. Enormously funny. Enorm and you know, these comic writers, when you listen to them, they are comics in their own right, of course. They're, they're funny people. And we don't, I mean, they're not, they're comic writers, but they're also comic performers. So when they read their own books, they perform. Wonderful. And the last one I've just finished, Eddie, um, sorry, um, Eric Idle, one of the Monty Pythons, and his book is called um, uh, Always Look on the Bright Side of Life. And most of the book is actually about that song, but I must say, I think of all three of them, the one that, the one that I, I just was in guffaws of laughter was Eric Idle, always look on the bright side of life. He is so irreverent, but, but incredibly funny while he does it. He's not just rude for the sake of being rude. You know, comedians, stand-up comedians, they're so few these days, really good stand-up, because the moment a stand-up starts using foul language and people find it funny, I just think to myself, you don't actually have anything funny to say. So, you are using foul language to compensate for the fact that there's not really anything particularly funny in the performance or in the... So, I think that's quite common with, um, uh, with modern you know, stand-up com com comics. I don't think that they're very... Trevor Noah is a South African guy. He's... He's, he's one of the more recent, very, very funny, funny people. Um, I'm just trying to think. Of course, the master stand-up of all time was Robin Williams. Now, again, Robin Williams would not shy away from bad language. But when he used it, it was more often than not extraordinarily funny, and it contributed, and it was, it was a significant part of the humour. Do yourself a favour, watch Robin, I'm sorry I'm just rabbiting on here, there's nobody else contributing to the conversation. It's a gorgeous evening, there isn't a breath of wind, the light is just beautiful. Anyway, do yourself a favour and watch Robin Williams explaining how the game of golf was invented. I think it is the, it is the, I mean, he is a master. He's a master. The equivalent British master comic would be Peter Cook. If you have ever listened to Peter Cook, uh, Peter Cook and Dudley Moore, and Peter Cook on his own, um, was an extraordinarily funny man. And he would do stand-up and he would do skits and, and, and sets and things and... and unbelievably funny man and Eric Idle talks about the day that Peter Cook met because Peter Cook was acknowledged with 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 British comedians as probably being the, the funniest of all by his peers likewise Robin Williams in the United States and some people got together com comedians got together and they decided that these two giants should meet and he talks about that in his book it's wonderful and it's wonderful for traveling long distance. It really is. I've, I've been asked many, many times uh, to take people on trips, actually act as a guided, you know, guided, um, a guide. I think I would be really, really bad at it. My trouble is that I do not suffer fools lightly. I, I, I really don't. And there are two things that push buttons for me. 
if I am confronted by idiocy and moronicness and just plain, one of the challenges that I have dealing with comments on YouTube actually, because I'm faced with morons. These people are morons. They've, they're, they're, I mean, it's astonishing sometimes. And I find that difficult to cope with because I don't deal with fools well. And the other thing is that if you want to press my button, patronize me. I just see red. I will not put up with it. I go to nuclear, thermonuclear war before I'll let somebody patronize me. So, what has this got to do with me taking people on tours? It's, cha it's challenging enough for me to, to film, go on, take, do, a, do a, you know, a trip, and all of the effort of filming, <clears throat> which I love. Make no mistake, I love it. But it is, it's not just a matter of pointing cameras at things. It's lots of thought and everything like this and, and the creation of whatever I'm... If I had to add to that looking after people and actually handling them, I go mad. I was recently asked by an Indian company to do a guided tour around with a self-drive. Now I said, okay, I'll do it. And I put a huge price tag on it. Ridiculous price tag. I must know that if I'm going to do that and handle that brain damage, it better be worth it. I wouldn't make a film. I might not even take a camera. I want to be extremely well paid, otherwise not interested. And I'll do my best for them, but when it's over, I want a big pile of cash. So, not much happening actually. Pretty darn boring. I'm going to stop talking now and eat the rest of my sandwich before it gets cold. A question often asked, do I carry guns, firearms, on my trips? Particular, particularly in Africa, where people say, well, you know, the dangers and everything of, you know, wild animals and people in Africa. The answer is a very simple no, I don't. I don't carry anything like that at all because it's absolutely unnecessary. So picture the, picture the situation now where I'm surprised by an, an animal. I'm in Africa, all right? And an animal comes through the bush and surprises me. I'm going to shoot it. <clears throat> so what am I going to do? So if it's a lion, so if lions come towards me now, I'm going to watch them. I'm going to make sure that we can get into the car and close the doors quickly. I'm going to watch them. They continue to come towards me. Okay, I'm going to get into the car. I'm not going to shoot anything. I'm going to wait for them to do whatever they've come to do. Okay, so um, if somebody came here to start causing trouble, am I going to shoot them? Who's going to come and start causing trouble? So in Australia, I mean, this kind of traveling is extremely safe. It's, it's just very, 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 very safe. In Africa, it is too. In m most of Africa, I say most because there are places that I wouldn't wild camp in Africa, certain countries in Africa. But the countries that I'm familiar with and I've wild camped many times, Zambia and um, Botswana, Namibia, Lesotho, where I've wild camped. And the interesting thing is there that I would, in a situation like this, there would never be areas as nearly as big as there are in Australia where I've, drew, I mean, I have not seen anybody in two whole days, not another human being, not another vehicle for two whole days now. Today's the, this will be the third day. That, that is, and unheard of 
in any of the countries that I've traveled in in Africa. And in a situation like this, <clears throat> I was wanting to wild camp, there would be a village somewhere. And I have on occasion, I don't always do it, but I have on occasion, if I find that the village is actually pretty close, I will go in and ask if I can camp under the tree there. And I will ask and try and find an old man, the Madala, and ask him, Sir, may I camp? May I camp there? They will always say, Eh, 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 which is yes, yes, please, yes, eh. No, they will be, they'll be excited that you're there. They'll actually really like that idea, that you've taken the trouble to come and visit them. What will then often happen is that <clears throat> the little children will arrive, often with firewood and often with water. That's their offering to you. They are not asking for money. It's very rare. It's, they're, they're not asking for handouts. They are welcoming you, and it's their way of welcoming you. The interesting thing, though, in a situation like that, getting back to firearms and protecting yourself, you are now the responsibility of the village, in a way. They don't want trouble. If trouble comes, they'll know about it, and they'll help you out. That's never happened to me. I've never had that situation. And... Um, uh, there was one place in Angola, I remember, the guide, they said, no, don't, don't camp here. And he, he managed to press Y. He said, no, there might be landmines. So <laughs> that was very, very, I mean, that was Angola. So, um, but why would I carry a firearm? Why would I? Yeah, I know, I don't. And of course, in Africa, crossing borders with firearms, you need very special permits. It's a real mess. If you don't need them, why, why carry them? So the simple answer is, no, I don't, because I don't need them. You know, this is definitely the, remote, the most remote I've ever been in Australia. Because the Canning Stock Route, although incredibly remote, there was traffic. That road? Nobody has driven that road in, uh, there, there are no fresh tracks at all. A week, two weeks, I don't know, three weeks. Again, another day without seeing another human, which is kind of exciting. Maybe, you know what? I have the same feeling that I had when I crossed the, the, uh, the, the Namib. This is the Sawgrab River Valley. There was an area there when I was, where I was on my own. I was incredibly remote. I think the next, the closest person would be from me here, realistically speaking, 40 kilometers away. In the northern Namib on my own. I was driving a 105. But that's a two hour drive. That was, that was really remote. This is and as much as I don't like driving at night, you know, finding a campsite at night, this, the car is so quick to set up that it's, you know, one can live with it. It's not really a big deal. But I suppose the nice part about it is that now when I wake up, I'll see the colours and I'll see, the, I'll see where I am. I just know that mm, the trees and things, but I'm kind of looking forward to waking up and seeing the place at first light.